This Halloween, ghoul all out with Instacart. Whether you're hunting for the perfect costume, eyeing that giant bag of candy, or casting spells with eerie decor, we've got it all in one place. Download the Instacart app and get delivery in as fast as 30 minutes. Plus, enjoy $0 delivery fees on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time, minimum $10 per order, service fees, other fees, and additional terms apply. Instacart, bringing the store to your door this Halloween. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Hello and welcome to Just Films and That with me, Josh Hallam. And me, Alice Oliver. This is the podcast where we talk about films that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or we just wanted to talk about them. We're also going to get stuck into some classic films that one of us maybe hasn't seen and maybe throw in some great guests along the way. Would you rather go 10 years forward in time or 10 years back in time? Oh, okay. Now, 10 years as myself yeah, and you, in you, my yeah. own life. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. not like back in time to, you know, down in Australia somewhere where someone else was Yeah, you don't a great get to time. pick someone else's life. Oh, it's just me. You're you. Me you're, 10 years ago. <laughs> you 10 years ago or you 10 years from now. Well, I suppose I. You, uh, do you get to come back if you go forward? Like you're not just stuck not 10 stuck years there. older? Um, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so you can go forward in time by 10 years, check it out, have a little look around, what am I up to, and then come back to 2020. I think I would probably go back 10 years to kind of reanalyze my life with fresh eyes, with older, wiser eyes. Never agree and- to come on a podcast about underrated films exactly (laughs) i'm gonna avoid mistakes like this Um, i think back i think back but i mean going into the future is also so tempting so yeah tricky one you've really uh, flummoxed me there josh what about you because i feel like the optimist would say 10 years in the future Mm -hmm. and the pessimist would say 10 years in the past because that kind of implies you know I would change stuff in a back to the future type way. Yeah. I must put, change everything. <laughs> I'd put a bet on Leicester to win the league or, or or whatever. But I think but then ten years in the future, what if it what if it's shit? What if it's awful? <laughs> like, what if what if you know you're just a you're just a complete and you know, a mess or whatever, which I, you know, I might be, but I'm going to say 10 years, I'd go 10 years in the past. Would you as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'd go 10 years in the past, yeah. I'm glad we could agree. Yeah, we're both incredibly pessimistic. Oh, absolutely, yeah, to the bone. <laughs> so this week's film, we'll jump right in, is Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992. So big spoiler warning for that. Um, Alice, you pick this one. I'll come to you in a second. Before we start, I am just going to call it Dracula. I'm not calling it Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> no, we can't continue, time. Josh, I'm afraid. So we mean, it's his Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992, a.k.a. Dracula, the, the Francis Ford Coppola one, the Anthony Hopkins one, the Winona Ryder one, the Gary Oldman one, the mm-hmm. Keanu Reeves one. Might get confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so you pick this one. So why did you pick it? Why did I pick it? I think, so I've only seen it once, uh, but it really sort of stayed with me and really made an impression. Not necessarily for all the right reasons, uh, but I'm sure we'll get to that later. Mm. Um, And I just, I certainly thought it was worth a revisit. So this is more of a revisit than a necessarily thinking it's underrated or underappreciated. So not to state the obvious, but it is um, the story of Dracula, uh, as you probably know from the books. Um, Alice. You've watched this again for the pods. What did you think on second viewing? So, 
Uh, my initial thoughts when I first watch it about uh, some of the performance being a bit off and maybe not so convincing, that still stood. But the second time around, I was very much taken with how it looked. Mm. Lots of very dramatic iconography. Mm. The film starts with like these crosses smashing and all these like dramatic sort of church scenes. Um, there was, yeah, angels. There was Gary Oldman coming in, sort of screaming into the camera like, ah! So it was a great opening, I thought. What did you think? So I, I'd never seen it before. Mm. Uh, the only thing I knew going into it was a few things. A new cast director. Um, and I'd heard... Two things, one of which was correct and one of which actually turned out to be incorrect. Mm. I'd heard that it was kind of a famously bad performance by Keanu Reeves, which is, I think, what a lot of people know. It's it's almost like when you say it to people, it's like, oh, yeah, Keanu Reeves is shit, English accent, basically. The other thing I thought was that it was a failure, like it was a commercial and critical failure. And as we'll come on to, I was very surprised to find out that I was wrong. Interesting. So I, I think what had happened is, I'd heard the Keanu Reeves thing and kind of extrapolated it out and, and gone, that must have been rubbish then. Mm -hmm. But that's that's not true. Um, same as you, I, having never seen it before, I thought it, it looked incredible. Mm -hmm. I thought that um, the sets were fantastic. It's so, it's it's kind of, it's gothic, mm -hmm. like Eastern European castles and all the, what you think of when you think of of, of, of gothic. I loved the special effects. A lot of it, I believe, was practical. So stuff like Dracula's shadow moving, um, the rats walk going onto the ceiling, the water dripping upwards, a lot of, of, of really great um, point-of-view camera shots of, of when Dracula is moving really quickly from place to place, you, you, you see his point of view. So o overall, I think I was surprised by how good it looked. And it certainly looked expensive mm. oh yeah <laughs> certainly um just like you were saying then with the way it looked i put i put brilliant use of fog as one mm. of my notes because that was brilliant when they were in the horse and carriage coming through the forest and the floor was just thick with fog i was like this is so over the top it's brilliant um the thing that you can really tell with this is that every single scene has been designed like from every single aspect, like every single kind of prop, every single camera angle, everything has been so thoroughly thought out and constructed to create this, this sort of vibe and mm. to kind of convey the story. Um, so for just every scene, you're getting just like a blast of information, kind of sound-wise and visually. Um, but then, unfortunately, Keanu Reeves opens his mouth. And it yeah. is unfortunate. And I, right, I am not here... I'm a big fan of Keanu Reeves. We've spoken about this previously. And I'm not here to slate him and I'm not here to, you know, slag off an actor or whatever. But it is, it's not a good performance and it really stands out in the film. And one yeah. of my notes was, um, I hate to say it, but I think it would be a better film without Keanu in, which is really sad. But I think, I think you're right. So I... Again, like I've already said, it, that was the thing I was looking out for. So it's almost like it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy because I, I'd heard it was he was rubbish. I was looking for him being rubbish. So I, I read about it, and he he so he, he plays Jonathan Harker in the film. Who and it, but he's not. When you think of the character of John, Jonathan Harker, he's way too young for a start. I think he himself has said because we're kind of saying his performance isn't great in it. But he himself has said in in retrospect of the film that he wasn't happy with his performance that mm. he felt like he was exhausted from doing other films oh. and that he just didn't quite he, i think the words he used or the, the the passage i read was something like i was trying to sum up the energy to do it right and do it better but i didn't have anything more to give oh but, wow oh that's sad at yeah. least he's, i mean he sort of recognizes that as well that's very yeah and I, and I don't always buy it when actors say you do hear actors who say you know i i never regret a performance i never regret i'm great in everything yeah, yeah. and you just think well if you can't look at your own work in any job and, and think about stuff you could do better or or change then you're not that's not really sensible is it do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? it's not an intelligent way to be I think what else doesn't help the the case for old Keanu 
is that he's surrounded by an incredible cast. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so if, again, if you've not seen it, it's you know it's Gary Oldman, it's Anthony Hopkins, um, Winona. it's Winona Ryder, who's obviously also very young as well. Um, what do you think of Gary Oldman's performance? I think. I think he did a good job. You don't get much of him sort of at the beginning. So you see a snippet of uh, Dracula, pre-Dracula, when he was mm. a man. What was his original name? So the it's Vlad Dracula. It's something in, in the film. It's like Vlad Dracula. Yeah. In real life, he's based on Vlad the Impaler. Yes. And his name was something like Vlad Dracul Tepes or something. And, mm -hmm. and it, it means dragon heart or something like that. He was, in, he was a famously cruel Romanian tyrant. I should have done more research. No, no, that's right. He was a famously cruel tyrant of the time who was mm -hmm. also popular in some areas, but that is who Dracula's based on. That's who mm -hmm. Bram Stoker based the character on. Okay, so we had Gary Oldman as his normal human self at the beginning. You get that for a little bit. And then as Dracula, so first of all, he's wearing a fuck ton of makeup. And all he's complete. He's done up completely... Like every single hair follicle, every bit of skin, everything has been touched. And to act well like that is a triumph in itself, I think. Uh, I did enjoy Gary Oldman's performance. And interesting to see him so young as well, because one of my first, like I first got wind of him, I think Batman, like, like mm. it was that late as Commissioner Gordon. Um, but I, I, as Dracula, I do think he, did, he had quite a big task in front of him. And I think he did an all right job. Certainly better than I remember as well. Mm. Like have, going back to revisit it. Well, what did you think? So I think, this was his, I think this was Gary Oldman's first leading role. Like you say, he is really young in it. But I think, I mean, he's not that young. He's not like in his early... He's about, he's like early 30s. He's about 34, something like that. He, I mean, I think he's great in it. Mm -hmm. he, he has a difficult job because what they're trying to do, I think, in the film is, is, is get a... Get away from the Hammer Horror Universal Dracula that's essentially, you know, the Bela Lugosi, Christopher Lee, the Count from the from Sesame Street, <laughs> Dracula. <laughs> Classic, yeah. <laughs> but also pay tribute to it. Mm -hmm. So it's that it is it is this thing of he is kind of quite hammy and he does have this this Eastern European accent, but at the same time, he is a whole new type of Dracula that I think at the time hadn't been done before they make him a man and they don't they stay away from a lot of the classic tropes but also pay homage to them at the same time which which we'll come on to but i um i thought he was good he carries the film very well he's very um i mean i i love gary Oldman. he's brilliant he's pretty much he's, he's good in bad things mm -hmm. um so i think he's 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 i'd like to know what he himself thinks of it oh yeah interesting gary if you're listening yeah get a good job it's just films in that pod at gmail.com <laughs> gary you've not replied to our other messages so one of my uh, notes was uh gary oldman very johnny depp in top hat and blue sunglasses you know towards he, the end when yeah, he's he trying is. to seduce um, he does look a lot like johnny depp it's the little much. beard yeah the little beard and the tash i think i heard actually that johnny depp was wanted for harker but he, they wanted someone like hotter, like at the time, because Keanu, oh. Re Keanu Reeves must have been like post Bill and Ted or he, during Bill and Ted. Well, I don't it know. looked, when, to, when I saw it, when he come up on the screen, I see his face. I was like, it, it, it's just like Bill and Ted. Like he's still so young, sort of so narrow. I was like, oh, young Keanu. He's a man that looked great without a beard, then got a beard and now looks bad without a beard like <laughs> yeah when you go back to yeah. it yeah um but he um no i think the cast is great i mean i um oh hey richard e grant little, was in it yeah. i forgot just see my notes then richard e grant the plays the doctor carrie elways or i can't even, i can never say his name carrie elways from princess bride and liar liar plays someone as well it's a great cast mm -hmm. i mean winona riders this must have been again quite at the peak of her kind of she kind of had that period in the early 90s where she was huge, then didn't do much, and then is big again. But no, I think the, the cast is great, and unfortunately, because they're so great, particularly Anthony Hopkins and Gary Oldman, because not only are they great, but they also carry a baggage when you watch it of, particularly Anthony Hopkins, of these the legends. You know, Gary Oldman wasn't a legend at the time, but he's become one, so that doesn't lend itself to looking at it from a 2020 point of view with 2020 vision. Um, but Anthony Hopkins obviously is... is was a legend at the time already, had done Silence of the Lambs and, and all, you know, things, the more classic kind of Attenborough films that he's famous for, Elephant Man and obviously, and, and stuff like that. Um, so that doesn't help mm -hmm. the Keanu issue. 
had I had put sorry to interrupt. Another one of my notes was that Keanu was acting like um you, you're familiar with friends. Mm -hmm. Dr. Drake Ramore. So when Joey is acting as Dr. Drake Ramore, it really reminded me of uh, Keanu's performance. So I, I don't, I'll admit, I've never really seen much of Friends. But what? I, but, but I understand, all, all my friends have seen okay. Friends. Yeah. <laughs> but I under, so I understand the references. Okay. It's acting like someone who doesn't really know how to act. It's, yeah. like, it's like they're trying, isn't it? Mm. So, however... I'll say this, he wasn't as bad as I thought he was going to be. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. So he wasn't good. good. No. But he wasn't, like, I thought it would be, jeez, like, I can't watch this. Yeah. And he's not good, but he's not, he's not, he, I just don't think he's horrendously bad. His accent isn't amazing. Mm -hmm. but I think the main problem is that he is miscast. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's not a role yeah. that, that Keanu Reeves should have played. I think mm -hmm. when you think Jonathan Harker, not that it had to be an English actor, but you think of a kind of tall well-to-do, skinny English man, almost like a Richard E. Grant. Well, I was going to say, you've got Richard E. Grant and Anthony yeah. Hopkins right there, so that it's not like there was no opportunity for, you know, there was transnational connections there. Exactly. I'm sure that he had, um, Francis Ford Coppola had plenty of British actors at his disposal. So I would, I am curious as to why, it, if he just thought that, like he, maybe if he saw Keanu and was just like, he's the guy, he looks perfect, he is how I see it in my mind. Or if he just so, I, I'm not sure. I have to look no, further I, I, into that. I, I think his casting reeks of you got to put someone hot in this movie. Yeah, to sell in, and he's hot right now, especially if he yeah. was coming off the back of Bill and Ted. It's like this guy's famous. Him. That's it, isn't it? it it's a case of if you want to do this movie your way, that's fine. But you got to put someone in there to sell tickets, then, and when on a ride is there, because mm -hmm. hearing hearing this accent for me isn't amazing. No, it's not, not great. Not absolutely great. Absolutely terrible. Mm. I don't know, maybe it's difficult, but there is a litany of films where Americans can't do English accents. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Kevin Costner, he just gives up after five minutes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, there's it's a, there's a lot. There's the, the bad accents in films that is something that bothers me quite a lot because I just think it, it takes away from the story that you're seeing instead of adding to it. You can't concentrate. Yeah, you just if, if it's thinking, a bad one. Yeah, and you, you just you... hear it all the time and then it becomes distracting. Like, I've got no issue. Like, if Keanu had done an American accent, I'd be like, all right, sound. Like, you just suspend your disbelief. It's like, oh, yeah, he's from London, but he sounds like that. Because then after about five minutes, you'd forget that and then, like, watch a stunning performance where the actor is comfortable and confident in what they're doing. And it's great, but some people can do... Very good uh, transnational accents, like from English to American. You know Anna Friel? Brilliant. She's Fantastic she actress. does great. Um, she does a great American accent. I didn't even realize. Mm. Dan Stevens as well. Mm. Brilliant American British. So it's, it, it it's can the be other done. way that's the problem. I think uh, it's 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 the US to us. Amer is the problem. Oh yeah, they were both examples of so like British English, people yeah. doing an American accent. Okay, so are there any American actors that can do a British accent? The one that comes to mind for me is um, Rennie Zellweger in Bridget Jones. I think she is good. She does do a good British accent. So it's certainly not too bad, and it's certainly like I definitely didn't come away from that film thinking, oh, that accent was terrible. So there you go. There you, you go. The, the key is to go for it to go unnoticed. <laughs> That's how you know well, you're nailing it. That's it, isn't it? Good acting shouldn't look like acting. Mm -hmm. It should look like you are the thing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what do you think of, of what they did with the Dracula mythos? Because Dracula is a character that's obviously been done so many times. It, it's got baggage. So going into it, what do you think of what they did with it? It feels like, I suppose, that it would have been, and maybe I'm bigging up Coppola a bit too much, but it would have been Bram Stoker's like, that's what would have been going on in his head as he wrote it, I think, because it is so fa massively fantastical, like, with the costume and the way that they do the scenes and stuff, and, like, everyone's hair and the design, and I just feel like you it is very fantasy. Like, obviously, mm. it's horror, but it's it reeks of fantasy as well because of the way that it just looks, and I feel like... Like Dr we know, like you say, it's Dracula, isn't it? We know the we know the deal. How many ways can you make that original? And I don't really think it was particularly original, but it was certainly enjoyable. I, I agree. I think what it is is it so going into it, people would have been thinking, you know, Christopher Lee, swept black, slick back hair, white, crisp white shirt, collar turned up, big cape. Um, or alternatively, you know, like you say, Bella Lugosi. So, you know, the cape over the mouth, the strong Eastern European accent, that kind of thing. And I think they keep some of that. He was Eastern European, so mm -hmm. therefore when he spoke English, he'd have an Eastern European accent. Mm -hmm. But I like that they do stuff like he has about 
five or six different forms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's a big wolf creature. Yes, he's yes. a big bat creature. Mm -hmm. He has a kind of old man form mm -hmm. that makes him seem more weak. He has another form where it's almost like he's this almost ancient type monster type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, the, he does the thing which they don't often do, which is he can turn into stuff, a pile. He turns into a pile of rats at mm -hmm. one point. He can turn into a kind of beastly dog type creature. So I like that they do that because all of that, I believe, is in the book. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I like that they, they, but they also pay homage to it by having him do stuff like have the Eastern European accent, have mm -hmm. the brides of mm -hmm. Dracula, have the, a lot of the stuff is a little bit more subtle. So a big castle on top of a hill, they do that, but it's not, you know, you know, big organ music as it, as yeah, it was. Yeah. It's subtle. And I, that's what I liked. It wasn't, it was a bit hammy and a bit campy, mm -hmm. but on purpose, mm -hmm. I guess. I don't know. Would you agree? Yes, yeah, certainly. And I think when, whenever you're sort of evoking images of that kind of time that they're sort of setting it in, it is quite like that because the characters are always a bit over the top and especially Dracula because it is very... It's all, it's kind of meant to be sensual, isn't it? Like, even sort of as he looks like an aged monster, there's so much to do with, like, sex and mm. stuff around vampires because it's all about, you know, the piercing and stuff. So I noticed Dracula cried quite a few times mm -hmm. during this film, which I quite appreciated. I feel like that's not necessarily always a sight. It's certainly not what you would associate with kind of vampires and darkness and evil. Uh, but then, no, there was a few times where his tears were streaming and you just really, you feel for the old fella. I well, I'll tell you something like movement, I suppose, to add to that, I really like that um, they make him a bloke. Like, he, he is a monster in the film and, he, you know, he does all the, the classic Dracula things, sucking blood and killing people and all that. But they give him a backstory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he is the way he is because he lost his wife. Mm -hmm. Because, and then he was, you know, she was allegedly cast out of heaven because she took her own life and all that. So I did, I did like that. I agree. Mm. Still and, quite and, human, and, even and, though yeah. grotesque in appearance. Exactly. Exactly. So I suppose, moving on to things that we didn't, like about the film um having watched it again what was there anything that kind of really stood up? we've done keanu's accent that's done that's in the back pocket you've got that don't need to gamble <laughs> well, have you got have you got anything that you didn't like about the film so there were a few technical things that i picked up so not so, so much narrative and that i thought that was all, all fine and that stood up but technically there was a few things that bothered me so there was a moment where a pot of ink spills onto a picture that Jonathan has of Wilhelmina and then Dracula picks up the picture all covered in ink and then gives it to Jonathan and he puts it in his pocket and there's no ink on the flipping picture and that really yeah. I just really noticed that and I was like that didn't make any sense because you get the perfect shot of the ink falling on the picture you're then looking at the picture very clearly for some time so there's no way to miss it and then it goes in his pocket completely clean. But how would you do I mean, don't put it in his pocket. If you don't want the guy to be covered in ink, just don't do it. <laughs> there was that. And then another thing I noticed, it was when Jonathan, he's kind of creeping around in the crypts and stuff. And he grabs a candle to use as a light. And it's just so, so clearly like an electronic candle. Like it's <laughs> lit from the bottom all the way up, even though it's like this thick kind of waxy thing. And it's got like this... Uh, um, sort of electric looking flame on the top. But then when it sort of gets to the end of the scene and Keanu goes to put it down, it's a normal candle just with a tiny flame on the top and he puts it down. And again, I just noticed that. But uh, the reason that was really noticeable is because the light emanating from the candle was leading his way completely. Like it was showing torch, all the way down yeah. the crypts. So again, it was very noticeable. It was a prop that was being held in close proximity to the main actors and where there was long camera shots of it. So I just thought that that's a real shame that that's been allowed to slip that way. I mean, I appreciate it. Listen, it's difficult to try and film anything that looks like candlelight or dim light. I get it. But it, they were just two really noticeable mistakes. I'm sure there was a few more. Well, I think what gives the candle away is when he turns it upside down and flicks a little switch on the bottom and goes, that's it. And, you know, <laughs> no, I'll tell you one Missed thing I noticed. Bit. What, one thing I noticed was um, when Mina and Jonathan get married, mm -hmm. um, she, they both drink. In the veil. She drinks yes. through her veil. Yes. So, like, she doesn't lift her veil up. She just lifts the cup yeah. to her lips. Yeah. I know, it's yeah, too. Like, I know I mean, what you mean, know. but also I do think, look, mistakes happen. Of course they But do. when you spend whatever 
tens of millions on a production. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much the budget was? Did you check? I did check. It, it's not... By today's standards, it's not lows. By okay. night, early nights, it's something like fifty million. Okay, yeah. So it's, not it's, a feral wage. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not end game, but it's not. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not, and it's not an indie film. So yeah. when you're spending that much money, I mean, yeah. come on. I think the candlelight thing is not the goof, but the the, the point you're making is interesting because one thing I a problem I had with it was it's just too dark. Yeah, and I don't very mean dark. the content, not, not subject matter. No, yeah. it looked too dark. It's yes. like some point it, stuff is happening, and you're kind of going. Oh, I can't, you can't see. Yeah. And I watched this completely in the dark. Oh, did you? <laughs> so like when, whenever we watch, whenever I watch the films for this, if I know it's going to be a dark film, mm -hmm. I go and watch it in our spare room. It's the darkest room in our flat. Shut the curtains, mm -hmm. I put it on the telly and, and make sure it's dark. Mm -hmm. And even then, even then, with no kind of light pollution, either the only light pollution I had was... Um, a little bit of my laptop, which I open and close to make mm. notes as I go. But no, and even then, it was a little dark. Mm. So, and I get it. You're trying to make it authentic and creepy and gothic yeah, and do it by candlelight. But I do need to see what's going on. Yeah, it's a shame if you feel like you are missing some of the stuff that's happening on screen because of it. Did you think, and this is another point I thought, did you think particularly the first half of the film, there was some elements that were a little hard to follow? Not that, not because they're dark. Like it's not always clear what is happening. Yes, I do feel that. Um, so some of Jonathan's motivations were kind of not completely clear. I think, and when they're spending the time in the house, kind of some some of the things, some of the sort of strings of action don't really seem to marry together. But then I also wonder, like, well, is it meant to be a bit kind of? jarring and it's it's all kind of meant to be creepy and there's like these weird camera angles and stuff and like you say about the shadows so there's i wonder how much of it was just down to you wanting to disorientate your audience but i don't know how familiar you are with coppola like i mean would, i know he, uh, not classics. actually that not that familiar another godfather yeah and i know that I know they hate, he hates superhero films, which is why he doesn't make films anymore, apparently. Oh, really? I believe what he is, he came out and said, since superhero films became the main money maker, he refuses to make films anymore. I mean, he is it. also in his mid-80s or something, so <laughs> it's probably oh, that's something, something to do with it. Yeah. But no, I don't, I don't know that much about I know he's mm. kind of obviously a master, and he's, he's up there with, he likes if you score Scorsese's and David Lean's and your Kubrick's for mm. making these amazing films. And and that's clear from the way he puts this film together. Mm -hmm. In terms of the way the story is told, I think it, there was a lot of elements of cutting between scenes where it wasn't entirely clear what was going on. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think it really, the film really comes into its own because I did enjoy the film. And it comes into its own for me in the second hour when Anthony Hopkins comes Arise. in as Van Helsing. He, yes, he, he kind of comes good. in as this exposition machine yeah. explains <laughs> yeah. and explains everything. And and then and then it really kicks on. Mm -hmm. But there's a particularly first maybe half an hour. I was a bit like maybe it is because Keanu Reeves' performance is distracting, or maybe it's because it cuts between him and Mina. And sometimes it's him doing a diary and a letter, and sometimes yeah. it's her doing a diary and a letter. And there's a lot of voiceover, but also, I mean, it's not that you're not as, the world is established right from the get go because mm -hmm. they do the thing of showing you in, in the 1400s. This mm -hmm. is what happened. This is how it's Dracula. Bam. But then when it gets into the Victorian times the late 1800s, it is like, I don't know, I, I was just a little bit unsure. Like, for example, it took me a little while to figure out who Renfield was. I uh, Literally, another one of my notes, Josh, you're in my head. Uh, I think I put, who is, oh, here we go. Who is Mr. Renfield? What is he up to? And Richard E. Grant, question mark. I haven't caught on to the purpose of their roles yet. So, so quite deep exactly. in, I was like, who are these guys? And as it goes, as it continues, you realise that Renfield is the guy that was sent there before Jonathan Harker. And that right, he see, went I didn't, I, so I, I didn't even pick up yeah, on that. But it's not, yeah, but it's not clear enough. Yeah. And Good, the I'm thing not is, just is that... Lucy, who's played by Sadie Frost, has three male suitors mm -hmm. who all want to marry her. One of them then does. They all appear to continue to be friends. Yeah. In this mates. weird, like, three guys just trying to get with a girl, but then one of them marries <laughs> her, and then they're, they're all still mates. I guess we're sharing. Like, what's going on there? Like, it's not... It's almost like... <sighs> I think what I've written is that it's, it's kind of trying to tell the story as it was in the book whilst also paying homage and to pre-existing material. Whilst also wanting to do his own whilst thing. Whilst also wants to do his own thing. So I think what happens is you end up with a... 
the first half is just a little bit, a little bit of a mess. It's a little bit inconsistent. It's almost like it overstretches itself. Mm -hmm. He's almost like he's gonna go, right, I'm gonna do Dracula, and I'll yep. do this, and I'll do this, but I also wanna do a little wink and a nod to this. Yep. And, yep. and then when Anthony Hopkins comes in, it's like he comes in and goes, right. Yeah, I'm here, here now, you can calm down. Here I am, Sir Anthony, <laughs> Sir Tony. <laughs> Here's Definitely, what's actually yeah. happening. Don't worry about it, kids. You got me. I mean, I love Anthony Hopkins. I'd pay that man to read me bedtime stories because it, he's just yeah. got the loveliest voice. It was, it was just such a nice touch as well when he when he did. And like you say about him being an exposition machine, but it was, but it wasn't unenjoyable. And it was great every time he was on screen and he was a little bit funny, like, because obviously mm. none of the other characters, it's not a comedy in any no. sense of the word, or it's not supposed to be. Um, whereas he did bring a bit of comic relief to it and that's mm. that's yeah i thought and, and that's he, that's difficult to do in a film that where there is no other existing comedy and thinking about the comedy in the film there was one moment again that i picked up on so richard e grant was bringing uh wilhelmina i believe into a cell and she and he just goes don't worry you'll be safe here and in the background you just hear someone going ah, yeah. ah, like they're being tortured to death and that was quite a nice little moment so I do think there were specks of comedy in it certainly yeah it's that kind of dark comedy comedy mm. and violence kind of element to it isn't it and, mm. and you're right there is there is elements of like because Van Hel the character of Van Helsing he just talks to people like shit he talks down to people because he knows a lot more about what he's doing than anybody else so no I, I completely agree with you but yeah Andy Hopkins comes in and as soon as he comes in you feel like you're in a safe pair of hands <laughs> but yeah. until that point it is a bit of a mess. Could go afraid. one way or the other, you know. <laughs> um, that's my only final point on things I didn't like, and this isn't really, it's not really a fair comparison, but unfortunately, I really love the film What We Do in the Shadows. Okay, okay. Which, if you've not seen it, ruins loads of this film. Uh, so I, I have seen it. So I've you know, seen it only recently, really. Jermaine Clement's character yes. is clearly just Gary Oldman's Dracula, isn't yes, he? Yes, so right. Got, okay, but even I to the bits where like, he, he does stuff like where he goes, see me, <laughs> see me. And it's yeah. like, but Gary Oldman does it. But because I'd seen that first, it's like when you see a spoof before you see the film. Mm. So like when you see a scary movie and then you watch Scream or whatever, and it's like, oh, God, it's ruined it for me now. Yeah. So there was a little bit of an element mm. of that, I, I'm afraid. So has that ruined all vampire No, films, there was just elements think? where when he did stuff, I kind of went... Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, because then you're thinking about the other film. I was just thinking about film. what we were doing in the shadows. I remember when Jermaine did that. So we'll move on to the critical reception then and try and, and, try and conclude on whether we think this is underrated or not. So... Am I right in thinking you haven't seen the, any of the critical reception in terms of the Rotten Tomatoes, the IMDb, that sort of thing? Correct. Not a clue. So, in general, where do you think this stands out of 10? Okay, out of 10. Let's see. If you're thinking about it in relation to other films, but then also think about the cast and the director, that carries a lot of weight. Hmm. So, IMDb score. Um, or just overall in general. Uh, Maybe... Maybe less than a six. So less than a maybe six. Maybe sort of upper fives, maybe. Is that a bit harsh? It is. It, it, <laughs> it get, actually gets 7.4 on IMDb. Really? Oh. Oh. It gets 71 from the critics and 79 from the audience on Rotten Tomatoes. So let's, okay. it evens out seven. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad I was wrong because so, I do like the film in its own way. I mean, I couldn't find... In terms of the actual professional critics' reviews, I couldn't really find much that really criticised it. So, like, Roger Ebert, for example, liked it. He was very much, you know, it's it's flamboyant, it's feverish, mm -hmm. but, but he enjoyed it. The one that, We've got one here that basically, basically says, kind of what we've said, it's narratively a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I mean, I couldn't really find much. Obviously, we have the Keanu Reeves thing, which we talked about, hangs over this film like it really does hang over this film because if you took him out of it i think you've got a classic on your hands unfortunately i and that's feel enough, the same yeah. nothing against keanu nothing really. at all Plenty this is the of... thing and you've got to be careful when you're kind of talking about actors in this way as well because it is a difficult job you don't know what they're going through behind the scenes you don't so you you want to kind of have that empathy there but like you say it 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 felt like such a miscast uh, mm. that it it was just kind of doomed from the beginning. Look, like we've said before, I, I'm not in the business of slagging off actors' performances. I think most actors have done bad and good performances. That's the way of a job. Mm -hmm. You have good days, you have Absolutely, bad days. Absolutely, yeah. And because he himself has retrospectively said this, I can say he, he does stick out like a sore thumb in this film. But mm -hmm. back to the point, 
Is this underrated based on those scores? Is it overrated? What is it in your eyes? Oh, I... So it feels like that. So that instinctively feels a bit high, the mm. sort of, but what do I know, right? Um, <laughs> but I did enjoy it, and I'm so glad that I watched it again as well. Mm. And I'm gl- I am glad that it got that score, because I do think you can tell that so much work has gone into it, and you can definitely appreciate it for that. I agree. I think it looks amazing. Script's a little bit hammy but kind of on purpose, a little bit mm-hmm. cheesy. Cast is great. Mm-hmm. Keanu Reeves does bring that down a little bit. Overall, yes, okay, it's narratively a little bit messed in the first half. I'm going to say, I am agree with you, slightly based on that, slightly overrated, but mm-hmm. I still enjoyed it. Yes. Would I watch it again? Maybe, but not soon. Yes, I feel exactly <laughs> the same. Maybe, maybe in another 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's one for uh, overrated. I think that's fair to say, Alice. I think so. I agree. But only a touch. (laughs) A little bit. Smidgen. (laughs) Um, So next week, it's my turn to pick. So I have decided we will watch a film from 2007 called Stuart, A Life Backwards. If you do want to watch it before next week, it's a little difficult to get hold of because it is a TV film. We'll talk about why we picked it next week, but to be honest, the only way you're going to be able to watch it is probably by getting the DVD. Old school. Yeah, so uh, old school pick, Stuart Life Backwards. Um, Look out for that uh, next week. We'll be back same time, same place. If you want to tell us what you thought of the film, if you want to suggest a film for us to do, please do get in touch. It's filmsandthatpod at gmail.com or tweet us at films underscore that. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram, filmsandthatpod. Um... Yeah, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Alice Oliver, thank you very much for, for joining me. Thank you very much, Josh. Pleasure as always. And it's goodbye from me. See you next week. Cheerio. Bye. Warm days and chilly nights and mornings means now is the perfect time to schedule a $99 heating and cooling check with the five-star experts at Crop Metcalf. That's right, for just $99, a Crop Metcalf five-star technician will check both your home's heating and cooling system for one low price. Call today and get peace of mind no matter what the weather is tomorrow. 1-800-GO-CROP or visit CropMetcalf.com. And remember, Crop Metcalf is the one with five stars. Crop Metcalf, home of the five-star technician and proud partner of the Washington Nationals.